Hello? Look, why is this? Why is she not breathing? I'm trying to do CPR. I can't okay, get her Okay, listen to me. I need Are help. You on Friday, the jury in the bathtub murder trial heard details of the massive overhaul of David and Shanti Tronis' home. Uh, they were taking a quest to appear on the show Zombie House Flipping. Keith Ory, the host of the renovation show, describing a meeting with the couple coming just a week before Shanti's death and outlining what stood out about her demeanor. I received a call from Mr. Tronis um, about six months after the first time and I, I went by the house. I wasn't expect, necessarily expecting very much, uh, but when I walked inside, uh, it was something I, haven't, I hadn't seen before. I don't think very many people get to see. Uh, we talk in terms, when we, with respect to renovations, we talk in terms of taking a house down to studs, meaning removing the drywall or plaster and on the interior dividing walls to gain access and move walls around. Uh, in Mr. Tronis's house, the, the studs had been removed. Um, there were no interior dividing walls uh, at all. In my recollection, um, there was a partial floor between the, fir between the first and second floor. There was a, a little bit of framing, I think, that you could maybe stand on, but you had to use a ladder to get to it, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, basically, the house was a, a large... Uh, almost like a shoebox, a two-story shoebox, and the uh, the uh, the alarming part was that the uh, not just that the interior dividing walls and supports were removed, but the exterior walls, which are framed. It's a 1920 something house, I think. Uh, the the exterior framing on the house was largely uh, destroyed by um, wood destroying organisms. So. Uh, it was basically being held up by two layers of plaster that had been at some point subsequently applied to the framing on the outside of the house and had created sort of a concrete shell. Ultimately, you're able to get this, this sit-down scheduled. Is this sometime in the middle of April of 2018? Yes, it was. I, by my recollection, it was the week prior uh, to Shanti's passing. Um, so tell, uh, tell the jury about that meeting. Um, you get to the house to have the meeting. Uh, what happens? Uh, I arrived at the house to meet Dave and Shanti. Uh, Dave was by the pool, uh, he, which is where, where I usually found him. It was a nice setting. And we spoke, and Shanti was not there. And I said, I, we really need Shanti to come down. And, uh, or not, I didn't know where she was. We really needed to have Shanti here. That was the point of the meeting. And uh, he, he hedged a little bit, and I said, you know, it's really quite important. So he went to the, uh, to the garage, and I th either yelled up the stairs or, I, mean, I, I don't know, he disappeared behind the door and came back with Shanti. Uh, if I remember, she had a, like a headset on, like a telephone headset type thing on. She was working. That was this, whatever job she did. Uh, I guess required that. Um, and she had come down um, and she was, uh, by my estimation, unhappy to to be there. Um, and it was in a sort of a tense state. Um, we ha we laid everything out. She said she was fully on board with the, with the renovation. Um, and then she left. And David explained that there were he it was obvious that she was un, unhappy with something and so did you so, have an opportunity to ex, sort of explain did you ever sit down during this meeting or did she stand the whole time she stood the whole time again by my recollection and um did she appear to be paying much attention to what you were saying or was she sort of dismissive of the conversation I wouldn't say dismissive she was paying attention because we were talking about you know material things but she was only there as long as she absolutely had to be and then left. Mm, so Shanti was unhappy. What does that clue tell us? Let's bring in retired police Sergeant Melissa Pinkleton and Dr. Carol Lieberman. Uh, Sergeant Pinkleton, to you first on this one. Uh, what are you thinking when you hear that, please? I think it's just adding to the other witness, the prosecution's other witness of Shanti's best friend, 
saying that there are problems in the relationship and that there is tension and she wasn't fully on board with this. And now you have this uh, producer, whoever, who's part of the zombie project for the redo for the house. And he's saying he even sees the tension between the two of them. So it's just building layers of, uh, of for the prosecution that everything was not copacetic like the original witness who started for the prosecution saying oh they always seemed happy they're always to get you know when they were together she had a ring she was proud of it you know it's kind of this pic facebook story uh, fairy tale picture and so we're getting other people going hey we've seen them in this light in this light and we have seen all these other sides so i think it's just building layers for the prosecution to say that he very likely had the motive to do this mm -hmm. sure yeah what the reason what may the reason behind it be uh, if he did murder his wife, as the state of Florida says he did, why might have he wanted her dead? Uh, Dr. Carroll, would you weigh in on that, please? Sure. Well, for one thing, you know, he had told her that he had millions of dollars. And um, I think she was getting closer to realizing that that wasn't true. She wrote something about how he's being really cheap in terms of uh, fixing the house. And um, and then he was saying he put you know at least a million dollars towards it. So I think a, a few things were coming to a head um, that he didn't want to be discovered, you know. And of course he wasn't working the whole time that he was there, uh, and and he, he didn't want to be discovered. And I think even though uh, this producer was saying that she was somewhat at the meeting, uh, you don't know what happened afterwards. And it seems to me that really, the, she, she obviously wasn't that excited about it. And perhaps she, you know, put her foot down even more. And people do um, really rash kinds of things, you know, when they, if they want to be on television or want to, uh, or want to see this as the solution for their house, they were already sleeping in different rooms, you know, so the relationship was not great. It was getting worse. Um, also, I just want to say, you know, yes, he may well have some sociopathic trends or, or traits, but um, but that wouldn't explain, sociopathy would not explain why he needed five years to be made competent to stand trial. Perhaps it's not schizophrenia. I'm not saying that it's necessarily schizophrenia. It could be bipolar disorder, which could explain some of, you know, some of his uh uh, why, he, where he spent his money on, or something or other. I, I don't know what the other psych component is, but it doesn't take five years to cure someone or to make someone competent to stand trial if they're only sociopathic. Mm, so you think something else is definitely going on there besides the sociopathy, if he is in fact sociopathic. Uh, right, right. Which he may be. Uh, we'll see as this trial rolls on. Uh, my goodness, lots to dig into here, and we expect the jury to be brought in any minute now to hear more evidence. We're going to hit a break as we're at the bottom of the hour. When we come back, we're going to hear from Shanti's friend and co-worker, as she recalls, learning about her friend's death. Detectives and investigators have recovered what's believed to be human remains. Chad Daybell's residence. You have two children who have vanished, and their mother doesn't seem to care about where her missing children are. If somebody two years ago said, this is what's going to happen with Lori. I mourn with all of you who mourn. I would have never believed it. Victim to Verdict with Ted Rollins. All new Sunday night, 8, 7 central, only on Court TV. Staying with us here on Court TV Live, I'm Julie Grant. So court is set to resume at any minute now in Orlando, Florida for day three of the bathtub murder case. On the stand on Friday, jurors heard from Shanti's friend and co-worker, Lori Kutcher, as she described learning about Shanti's death and the defendant's demeanor on that tragic day. Uh, at what point was it that, that you found out that Shanti was murdered? So Shanti was the Shanti was sorry that Shanti had died. So Shanti was supposed to come to TriTech um, on Thursday. I guess it would be at the 26th for our quarter in review. And, and uh, sorry, let me stop you there. You said the 26th. Do you mean April 26th of 2018? I believe so. Yes, yes. And so um, she was supposed to come for our quarter in review, and our computer systems went down. So my supervisor said, you know, go ahead and call Shanti and tell her don't bother to head this way because without the computers, there, you, we have nothing to look at. And I called the process improvement phone line and Dave answered and told me that Shanti had passed. Okay. 
Uh, when you were told that, do you recall any specifics of what he said about that she had passed? Um, he said he came home and he found her and he couldn't resuscitate her and that he called 911 and there was nothing they could do. Okay. Um, what did you do after? And this is a phone conversation? Yes. What did you do after that phone conversation? So I was very hysterically crying because, you know, Shanti was my mentor. She was also my friend and my business associate. And um, I went into my boss's office to tell her that what I had just learned from Dave. And Dave was crying when I talked to him on the phone and all upset. And so Tammy said... I must have still been on the phone because Tammy said, call him back and tell him when work is over, we'll come by there to see if there's anything he needs from us or anything we can do to help him. And so that's what I did. And so, um, so at some point, I guess you after the conversation, did you actually go um, to uh, the Tronis house? Yes, we did. Okay. Uh, and this is is this still on April 26th? Yes, it is. OK. Um, and so um, you get to the house. Uh, do you make contact um, with David Tronis? Yes. Okay. Um, can you tell me about what happens then? So he, we got there and we came up to the gate and we called out to him and he showed up. I don't know from where, but he showed up and he let us in and we talked in the garage and he was crying and distraught and very upset and said that, because, so here's the thing with Shanti, with the being prompt with the clients, then David had told me that he had been questioned all night at the police department. So I knew that Shanti probably had 3000 emails that had cumed up at that point in time. And I asked David, did I have permission to notify the clients? And he said, yes, but I felt it was disrespectful to notify the clients before notifying Shanti's family. So then I said, have you notified Shanti's family and friends? And he said, no. So Tammy and I offered to help him do that. And did you ultimately assist in, in notifying some, some individuals about? I personally did not. Tammy made some phone calls because I was pretty distraught myself. So. And when you went to the house and you, you talked to Dave, um, did you have any further discussion about um, how Shanti died? He told us that she had head trauma and facial bruising. Okay. Um, did he tell you that, that um, the police had told him that she had been murdered? He did not ever say murdered, no. Um, did he tell you um, that she had been strangled? Never. Now let me bring back in my guests, retired police sergeant Melissa Pingleton and Dr. Carol Lieberman, forensic psychiatrist and body language expert. Uh, Dr. Carol, uh, you are a medical doctor, and when we have the story about, oh, drowning in the bathtub, that's really tragic and sad, versus, oh, wait a second, at autopsy, her hyoid bone is broken. How might that happen? Manual strangulation, perhaps, and also we've got the head trauma and the bruising here. Uh, would you speak to how these stories are just so incredibly inconsistent? Yes, um, it's almost like, you know, trying to find something to, to explain all of it, and he keeps changing his story. Um, you know, it's interesting. So there really isn't any clear, I mean, I'm sure when we hear from the... Uh, you know, the person who did the autopsy, they'll be able to put it together better, but it's really not connected to the things that he's been telling about what happened. Right. I mean, you know, she drowns in the bathtub. Oh, wait a second. Let's talk about how she got beat up. Let's talk about, you know, when I think right. a broken hyoid bone, I always think of what I learned from the great Dr. Cyril Wecht. Manual strangulation right. causes right. that. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, Sergeant Pinkleton, I mean, when you arrive at a homicide scene, you know, I'm sure if you see bruising on someone's face and they're in a bathtub, you're going to ask the question, well, wait a second, how'd they get the bruises here? Even if she did drown, if the drowning was ultimately what caused the death, we know there were the injuries that occurred prior to death that can be detected at the autopsy. Tell me what you're documenting if you arrive at that scene, Sergeant. Well, if I'm arriving that scene, I would absolutely be, have documented if there were actual any visible bruises at the time, because a lot of so a slip, a, a genuine slip and fall in a bathtub where you might hit your head and there would there'd be a laceration or something, you'd be able to document that. But a lot of times in genuine bathtub drownings where people injure themselves, like let's say they hit the back of their head and then they drown, a lot of times those things do not come up and are not able to be seen or uh, diagnosed 
until the autopsy. So I'm wondering what the police report says as far as what the first responding officers actually saw and documented versus what he's telling this woman on the phone and regarding the business and go ahead and answer emails, because I, I feel like that's probably going to be inconsistent. And I'm glad you brought up the hy hyoid bone because um, last Friday when I was on with Judge Ashley, uh, we were talking about that and she had petechia as well. And so, and I had asked about the hyoid bone. So yeah, petechia and hyoid bone equals strangulation all day long, all the time. Maybe <laughs> there might be one fluke, but all day long it equals strangulation. And so, and he's talking about those injuries, but I would be curious to see the police report if they documented that. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, I'm sure it'll come out uh, as we get those witnesses on the stand and see uh, what they uh, what they went through there. Uh, Dr. Carol Lieberman, uh, a guy like this, if he's a sociopath, and we don't know if he is, if he is, do you think it's likely he's going to want to get up there and take the stand? Well, not necessarily. I mean, he'd also have to be narcissistic, <laughs> which he may well yeah. be. Um, but um, yes, you know, he could he might well do that, because especially if things are looking rather grim. But you know, the thing is, that um, the, his attorney had apparently tried to um, ask for not guilty by reason of insanity to change the plea to that. And the judge, uh, I don't know if it's the same judge or a judge, um, wouldn't let her do that or he, wouldn't let his lawyer do that because they, she had missed the deadline. Well, isn't that just right from the get-go uh, a grounds for appeal for him? Dr. Carroll, I'm glad you brought that up. Kelly Kraft and I were talking about that a short time ago on my show opening statements. Uh, it could potentially be problematic. Uh, Kelly was looking into that, the filing and uh, the rationale behind that. I just wonder if they would have the expert testimony to support it, if there is somebody who would in fact say, uh, what went on here because we we have what looks more like a cover-up what looks an awful lot like somebody who is is manufacturing a story here i've got a clip from his interview with police um and uh here this clip focuses on how um the death didn't look natural you heard the water and didn't hear her you felt something was wrong I went upstairs. I don't hear her talking on the phone, so I say hello. I don't hear anything then. I can hear water running. Um, she's not saying anything. Doesn't seem right. Sometimes it is hard if you have the water running to hear somebody out there. So that that was my assumption. Okay, so you, it's one room. You don't see her until I get yourself. Mm -hmm. Is the bathroom door open or closed? Open. Open. Okay, and so you walk toward the water that you're hearing? Yeah, we'll come to the bathroom. Okay, the door is open, and what happens? What do you see? I see her laying with her head in the right hand corner. Um, the water is running, but I don't think, I don't think that drain is closed because if it was it would be it would be going over right so the water's like half full she's submerged partially but she's also partially not submerged and one of her legs is kind of sticking up and out a little bit and it's just extremely awful and it doesn't look natural obviously she fell or something happened and I, um, I tried to pick her up. I turned the water off. I tried to pick her up. Um, she's, she's stiff. It doesn't look natural because it's a homicide, uh, in my opinion, based on all the evidence I've seen. Oh, Sergeant Pingleton, this guy's making me mad as I'm watching him. Uh, what'd you think of that clip, yes. please? First thought, honestly, still same voice, still yeah. same voice, yeah. Um, but no, it, it, it's just, it's almost like he's making it up. He, it, when he commented, he's like, well, it wasn't overflowing because that would have to mean that the drain was closed, right? right it's right. almost like in his mind, he's like, wait a minute, I have to justify why the tub wasn't overflowing. You right. can almost see him 
going, I've got to cover this. I've got to cover this. So yes. that's how it struck me if sitting in that room. And he's like, okay, the drain was open. That's why it wasn't overflowing. And he's going, and also the way he's describing it is, and a lot of people do go, so he's going so slow, just, you could almost tell it. He's trying to really be careful what he's saying so that he doesn't trip himself up. And, he, and it's not working because his body language is not matching his words for the devastation that he saw and for reliving that traumatic moment. A lot of people, when they have to recall a traumatic moment of finding a loved one dead, their body language matches up with their words. And none of this is flowing. None of it, it's, it's all very um, disjointed. It's all very fragmented. And so just the totality of all, I, I, it's a cover-up. It's a homicide. This, all of the signs are there for homicide, homicide, homicide.